You know, what's funny, and, and this is this is a true story. In fact, Greg Oden was just at my house last week, and, and we were laughing about this story. When we were getting ready to go to Chicago for the Big Ten tournament, and Gene Smith, my boss, was on the committee, the NCAA committee. And so he calls me on Wednesday and says, hey, look, I'm going in seclusion. Good luck. I can't talk to you. And I said, hey, Gene, do me one favor. He said, keep me away from two teams. And he goes, who's that? And I said, Butler and the Xavier. Welcome in, Xavier fans, to the Xavier Basketball 100 Years Podcast, brought to you by Heartland Bank. I, Brad Redford, will be your host as we connect with some of the most famous Xavier coaches and players in Muskie history. This week, I have Coach Thad Mata, who led the Muskies to the Elite Eight in 2004. Coach Mata talks about his special moments at Xavier and much, much more. Enjoy this interview and stay tuned for more Xavier Basketball 100 Years podcast interviews. You were only at Xavier for three years, but... Just an incredible stretch there. In three years, your team's compiled 78 wins, just 23 losses, two A-10 regular season titles, one A-10 tournament title in dramatic fashion. And that's, you know, many people's favorite team still to this day, the Loyal Xavier fans that they are. So how do you look back at your time um, at X in the scope of your coaching career? Well, I I tell you this, it, it was three of the greatest years coaching because we we had success, um, and and you know the first two years we we win the Atlantic Ten, um, we then won the A uh, uh, Ten tournament my first year, and you know David West at the end of the season had came in and told me on a Monday that he was going to declare for the draft, which I completely understood, and we were having our banquet that Tuesday night and the seniors get done speaking. He stands up and uh, gives a real emotional speech and says he's coming back. And I was like, what? <laughs> and uh, David, David was one of the best players I, I've ever coached or ever had the opportunity to coach. And his mind, like I used to try to explain to guys I was coaching how, how he thought and just how mentally tough he was. Uh, but, you know, and then the, along those lines, you know, the first two years were, were – pretty smooth and then that third year we, we were struggling now and, and I think that was something that helped me more as a coach you know we were 10 and 9 going into the crosstown shootout and I think Cincinnati was number six in the country and we we were not playing well and and all of a sudden Lionel hits the last Lionel Chalmers hits the last second shot we win the game and you know it seems like the next thing I know we're, we're tipping off in the elite eight in Atlanta to go to the final four and um so in, in the three years I was there, I got uh, uh, great lessons in coaching. You know, coaching uh, the great players that we had from David West, National Player of the Year, Lionel, Romaine. Um, you know, I, I think the other thing I learned there, you know, I remember we started Justin Cage and Justin Dolman as freshmen. I don't think either guys were, were top 100, top 150 players out of high school. And they're starting to go to the Elite Eight as fr- or the Final Four as freshmen. And so there, there were just so many like great lessons that I learned there. I think the other thing that was, was amazing at the time was when, when I walked into Xavier, just the pressure to win. I say that because it, it made me tougher. It made me more calloused as a coach. And the, 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 the pressure to win was, was phenomenal for a young head coach to be in there. And, and knowing, you know, when we were sitting at 10 and 9 and the, the wheels were off the, the car, and and I give those players credit, man. They turned it around, and and uh, what a magnificent run we had down the stretch. Was there anything in particular that sparked that change for that team? Was it an individual player? Uh, was it just you know the two freshmen coming along, a mix of a mix of things? But you know, in your mind, if you can go back to that time, you know, what was it yep. for you that really kind of sparked that team to do what they did down the stretch? You know, I I, I think that the number one thing that happened was. I remember having a meeting with Lionel Chalmers one night after practice. And, you know, the, the, the one thing when I walked in there, and I've always, I told my team at Ohio State this, those guys were competitors. They were winners. And, but I remember sitting down with Lionel and I said, look, man, you, you're, you're putting too much pressure on yourself. You, you're trying to do everything out there. And I think you just got to let the game sort of come to you. 
you know, it is back and, and you'll laugh at this, but, uh, you know, we were sort of like one of the first teams that were running pick and roll. We had done it at Butler and I finally explained to Lionel, I said, look, when you come off the pick and roll, you do have to pass too. You just can't shoot it every time. <laughs> and as he started doing that, the, the floor just opened up and, you know, Romaine got going and, and, um, you know, Anthony Miles started playing really good basketball. It was just a, it was, it was a, just a kind of a collective come together and, and, uh, what, what a fun season that was. Yeah, and taking down the uh, number one team in the country in the A-10 tournament, and I'm, of course, talking about St. Joe's, Jameer Nelson, Delonte West. Do you remember in preparation for those two guys in particular, you know, what you told well, your guys? I mean, you'd obviously played them earlier in the year, but it, super talented yeah. players, great with the ball. You know, how did you approach that game? And maybe from a defensive philosophy, how did you approach handling those two guards? Well, I, I know this with, with Jameer – we our our rule was he had to take more shots than points he scored. Mm. So I remember one year we were, we were playing him at St. Joe's, and we beat him in overtime. And he had twenty eight, but he took like thirty shots in the game. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, check, we we did what we were supposed to do. You know, earlier in that year, in in '04, I guess it was, um, Delonte West came in, and I think he was. Uh, Nine for nine, or I'm sorry, 12 for 12 from the floor and six for six from the field. He made all 18 shots that he, he shot. It was just like, it was an amazing uh, story or amazing game for those guys. But, you know, when we got him in the in the tournament, we, we were, we had to win. I mean, we weren't going to go to the NCAA tournament unless we won the tournament. And uh, I just remember looking at the scoreboard in the second half. We were up 39 points. Mm-hmm. And they, they went on like a 4-0 run. I'll never forget Sean Miller. I was like, call timeout. I'm like, call timeout. Let's just get this thing over with. <laughs> so, but uh, no, those guys, I mean, that was a, that was a, heck, of a, a heck of a run there. Yeah, Sean always had that pit bull in him. I only got to play for him for one year. But, man, he, still, when I see him on TV, his eyes, they still strike fear into me. I mean, I remember <laughs> going over into a huddle, and I remember I would do something wrong, and – I'll never forget in a tournament game, we were playing against uh, Portland State, I believe, out in Boise, and I was a true freshman on the team. And, you know, I was, I was in for, you know, they'd give me 12 to 15 minutes, hit a shot, get out, you know, that, that was my deal. Right. Well, I allowed a three-point shot in the corner at the end of the first half, and Sean right. Miller waited for me in the tunnel. And, I mean, <laughs> I, I literally thought he was going to beat me in half. I mean, I thought I, thought I was done for the rest of the tournament. But thankfully, we won the game. He did not play me in the second half, but he let me play in the other two rounds. Uh, Great. Uh, so I actually went back today, and you can go to YouTube, and you can type in the, uh, the uh, Xavier uh, Duke game when you guys made it to the Elite Eight. Right. I mean, that, that Duke team had, you know, names that everyone knows. You know, J.J. Redick, probably the biggest name on that team, but there was, I believe, Chris right. Duhon, Sheldon Williams. You know, what was that? Lou uh, That's right. Lou Didn't he come off the bench for that team, too? I don't even know if he was ah. a starter because they had Daniel Ewing. Um, dang, probably did start. I, I can't imagine he didn't. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't remember. Yeah. But when you, you know, look at the guys, like, I mean, Dolman hit a huge three as a freshman. Uh, Chalmers right. played well. And then you had, I believe, Anthony Miles in the post. And, and he was going yep. right at Sheldon Williams. And I felt, you know, early on in that second half, I mean, his physicality in the post just really set the tone and, you know, almost got you guys the victory. But, you know, maybe talk about that game, the preparation for that, and, and then saying goodbye to that crew. Yeah, you know it's, it's it's so funny because the the, the preparation. I, did you ever play against Duke in your career? Uh, I didn't. I, I don't want to speak about it to be honest with you. It was it was the only game that I played, and I wanted to end within ten minutes of the game starting. We we we, we did not play well. well. If you remember, Duke and and you know I haven't coached against them probably five or six years, but they were never a real hard team to prep for. You know, they, they were spacing, and and he put those guys in position because they, he's got great players, and, and they sort of did their thing. So the, the preparation wasn't, uh, uh, you know, that difficult. It was more of the personnel that we had to be in line with in terms of, of how we were going to guard guys, how we were, you know, what we were going to try to do with J.J. Redick and, and 
know, all the screens he was coming off and his catch and shoot ability is, is obviously as you still watch him today is unbelievable. Mm-hmm. But um, I, I just remember we we got in trouble uh, with the, the action that was hurting us was a high middle pick and roll with Luau Dang, Dang picking and popping, and we could not get back recovered. And, um, and that was, that was something that was really, really, and then Anthony Miles fouling out with seven minutes to go was, was the game. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I honestly, I think that he, because he was playing at such a high level that day, um, you know, it was just, it was kind of like, Hey, we, we got a shot here, but, uh, you know, un- unfortunately it, uh, uh, didn't go our way that day. And now a quick break in the action to enjoy a word from our sponsors from Heartland Bank. Come on over to Heartland. Now, to run a successful business, you need to develop a strong relationship with your accountant, your attorney, and most importantly, your community banker. If you find it hard to get advice from your bank, maybe it's time to consider Heartland. I'm Scott McComb, CEO. Come on over to Heartland, where banking really feels good. Rare banking feels good. Member FDIC, Equal Housing Lender. Okay, so be sure to check out Heartland Bank right after this 100 Years podcast interview. Um, right. Okay, so, all right, now let's maybe move over to the, the complicated relationship between you and Xavier fans because then there's a transition process, um, you know, relatively quickly after that, you move on to Ohio State. Uh, can you just right. talk about uh, making that decision, maybe how challenging uh, that was, or, or maybe is there anything you may have changed about that process? Yeah, you know, the, the the funny thing is there's two sides to every story. And I I would all I would say about that is I felt I was doing what I was supposed to do in terms of who I was reporting the process to. And now did that person tell anybody? I don't think so. But I was reporting to the person I was supposed to mm-hmm. 100% tell them what was going. And, you know, the funny thing is that I pulled out of the job the night before I was going there to interview. I, I called Ohio State Andy Geiger and said, look, I'm out. I'm staying at Xavier. I got a great thing here. I love this place. And he says, you need to come up here. And I said, well, I don't, I don't want this. is like 1130 at night and I'm supposed to leave at 6 in the morning. Mm-hmm. And I said, I just, I don't have a good feel about it. This is, this has been crazy. The the media is, is taking this thing and, and really cast a, a, a bad light on, on me. And, but, you know, I, I think from the standpoint, it was, it was a difficult situation because it was a hundred miles down the road and Ohio state took a month to hire. Mm. So every day it's just like, you know, if, if, you know, what was I supposed to do? Uh, uh, but by the same token, I, I, I'll be dead honest with you. I grew up in the heart of Big Ten, and I, I wanted to coach in the Big Ten. That was that was a dream. That was a goal of mine was to to coach in the Big Ten. And and um, you know, looking back, would you would you do a couple things? To, yeah, probably. But by the same token, it was it was you know when I walked out of since our Xavier, I knew this. We had left the program better than we had found it. And, and I was happy about that. And, and the fact that Sean was taking over, I knew it was going to be in great hands. I knew that they were lined up to win a lot of basketball games over the next few years. So I was, I was at complete ease with, with the decision that I made. Yeah. So waiting for a month, I can't imagine how difficult that was. And, and especially, you know, and we've already talked about it kind of in great length, but how, how much of a you know, a good team that you had and how connected you were with the players, you know, how difficult it can be to move on. And then, you know, another memory that is, I don't want to bring up because our fan base is going to kill me for it. But one of our more painful memories is when, when we play Ohio state in the NCAA tournament in 2007 and Xavier plays an incredible game. And, and, you know, that Ohio state team was amazing, full of talent, you know, number one seed, uh, right. the best team in the country, probably behind Florida that year. And you guys, I believe, made it to the national title that year. We did, yeah. But Xavier yep. is up three with, I believe, under 10 seconds to go. And yep. just just a, a dagger three, uh, you guys kind of run away with it in overtime. 
But do you remember any emotions in that game? Like, I cannot believe that I'm playing Xavier and then maybe reflecting on it now uh, well, that you took that game from the Musketeers. I mean, I'm I'm hurting right now because I, I, I bleed Xavier blue, and it, it, it's still hard for me to bring that up. What's funny, and, and this is this is a true story. In fact, Greg Oden was just at my house last week, and, and we were laughing about this story. When we were getting ready to go to Chicago for the Big Ten tournament, and Gene Smith, my boss, was on the committee, the NCAA committee. And so he calls me on Wednesday and says, hey, look, I'm going in seclusion. Good luck. I can't talk to you. And I said, hey, Gene, do me one favor. He said, keep me away from two teams. <laughs> and he goes, who's that? And I said, Butler and the Savior. And he starts laughing. And he goes, yeah, you don't want to play them because you coach them both places. I said, no, 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 no. I didn't do with that. They have pick and pop fives. Mm-hmm. We can't guard pick and pop fives. Greg, Greg doesn't come away from the basket. <laughs> so sure enough, if you remember, I think Josh Duncan had four or five threes in the game, mm-hmm. and it was just it was one of those where the matchup was it was a, a tough, tough matchup for us. Um, I, I remember when that game ended. I, obviously, I was elated, but I, I was kind of sick because so many of those guys we had recruited. And I, I, you know, I, I remember uh, the the year after I left Sean's first year. I don't think they went to postseason play because they were they were still pretty young. We'd lost, you know, Romaine, Lionel, and Anthony. Um, but then the next year, I remember sitting in the uh, in the hotel in Indianapolis for the Big Ten tournament. I'm watching Xavier win the Atlantic Ten, and just tears going down my face because I was so happy for those players and, and for Sean and his staff. And um, so that one was a, a very emotional game for me. I'm like, God, anybody but Xavier. And, <laughs> and uh, it, you know, it, it's funny because I was telling Greg the other day to, to do over again, that, that was almost one of the biggest regrets I've ever had in my life in coaching. Because when Xavier beat, I think it was BYU in the 8-9 mm-hmm. game, yep. um, I played it off as just another game with our players showed no emotion, no big deal. Like it's not, you know, Hey, and to do it because I knew those guys were going to come out and, and play the game of their lives. Mm-hmm. I would, I would have built that game up like it was the national championship game. And, and, uh, fortunately, man, did I learn a, a lesson through winning, but, uh, uh, it could have very, very easily been a loss, that's for sure. The Coach Miller and yourself, did you guys take a break from talking a- after that game? Did you, you, know, did you guys give a couple weeks, or, or how, did, how did he respond to, to that loss? No, I, I think he was obviously devastated because you, I mean, they, they had us. They had us on the ropes. Um, but I remember, you know, Sean and, and Archie came to my hotel room in Atlanta for the Final Four, and, and, actually uh, watched some film, I think, going into the, the Florida game um, on Sunday night. And so, no, it, it was it was all good. I mean, just I, – I've always said this, and people never can understand this. One of my, my biggest uh, pet peeves in coaching was coaching against friends. Mm-hmm. Man, did I hate that. Um, you know, guys that I had worked with and um, just I never, ever enjoyed that aspect of, of the game when I was going against a friend just so gut-wrenching because uh, you know you you want those guys to do well but you want to beat them mm-hmm. and um it, it definitely makes it challenging but by the same token you know you've always got a job to do and um but no all, all those guys that, that have uh that i worked with and as a head coach or my assistant coaches man I, I couldn't be prouder of the job they're doing right now all right xavier nation here's a quick break for a word from our sponsor heartland bank if things are changing at your bank maybe it's time to change banks Heartland Bank has been proudly supporting the communities that they serve since 1911 and encourage Xavier Nation, and I do too, to buy local and to bank local. Community banking is alive and well. Go check out Heartland Bank, a proud sponsor of Xavier Athletics. I think a lot of hoops junkies like me are just, you know, when we think about you and your career, not just at Xavier, uh, but Butler, Ohio State, we think about how many games you won. I mean, you never really had a losing season. I think 16 of your 17 seasons as a head coach, you won 20 or more games, 13 NCAA tournament appearances, Final Fours, Elite Eights. I mean, how did you create that winning culture, you know, so early on um, as a leader? Well, I, I think 
first and foremost, I, I had great mentorship in, in terms of the, the people that I work for. Um, you know, and I was, I was very, very lucky uh, becoming a head coach at age 32. And, you know, the programs that I took over, taking over Butler back in 2000, you know, Coach Barry Collier had just done a tremendous job of, of building the culture and the program and, and, and building the, the program the right way. And then going to Xavier and, and following Coach Prosser, um, you know, kind of the, the, the same situation um, in terms of the, the, the cupboard was full. There were some pretty good players there. And, and you know, we had to go in and, and sort of uh, uh, implement our system and, and uh, you know, sort of the culture we wanted to have at Xavier, which was, was, was kind of fun, to be honest with you. And, and then, you know, along the same way, just the, the same thing going to Ohio State. I mean, that program was in shambles when we got there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, you know, that one, it, it, we probably turned it around quicker than we ever thought we were going to. But I think just in terms of I, I was always surrounded by, by great assistant coaches everywhere I've been. Um, you know, and, and, and you look, uh, you know, I've always said this, I think, you know, Xavier is one of the best basketball schools in the country. And, you know, for my second job to be there and, you know, and obviously <laughs> the, the same thing and as, as well as Ohio State. So I was very fortunate to, to be in a sort of a triangle in my coaching career. How did you balance the playbook like in your head with your staff, with the players? You know, it's always that I think delicate balance of your mental toughness, philosophies as a program, as a culture, and then X's and O's. You know, were there certain principles that you would lead practice with or leave your players with? Uh, and then how did you kind of combine that into what you did in your practice regimen and in-game strategy? Yeah, you know, it, it's funny because I, I always had uh, – there were there – were, gosh, I'm trying to think – 12 things on defense I felt like we had to cover every day and, and 12 things on offense. And, and a lot of, you know, the offense was skill work and, and getting guys shot, that sort of thing. But in terms of, like, execution and, and you know, the, the five on O and breaking down your, your cutting actions, your screening actions. But I, I always took the, probably the first 50 to an hour of practice, and, and we, we just did our, our core things, you know, from shell drills to uh, – uh, you know, competitive rebounding drills, that sort of thing. But we were, we were always going to work the basics, always work the fundamentals. And, and I'll tell you this, but I was a guy, we practiced really, really fast. Um, you know, I, I don't know if I'm ADHD or whatever, but my attention span wasn't <laughs> real long. Me too. And, yeah, and, and I wanted, I wanted activity. I wanted energy and practice. And, you know, we never practiced a, a, like for an extended period of time, you know, a, uh, two and a half hour practice was a long practice uh, for the teams that I coached, but they were they were high pace, high intensity. And then, you know, I, I wanted guys to, to compete every day in practice. I wanted them, you know, when we got to the the, the nuts and bolts of, of scrimmaging or situation work, whatever, you know, I wanted to, I wanted them to go. And and I, I do think this. I think guys enjoyed the practice uh, format that, that we had. Uh, come up with and, and how we did things. How did you address players uh, when they weren't doing what you wanted them to do? When, you know, maybe you were having a rough practice, rough stretch, you know, is it something that you would do in front of all the other players if you felt like you had to, or were you more of a coach that would take guys in the office and set up the time to kind of have that individual conversation? Yeah, it, it all depended how good the player was. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I think, uh, I, I was probably more along the lines of, of individual. You know, I was never a guy that – I never wanted to play mind games with guys and they're trying to figure out what I'm doing and all that. I, I just I, – I never liked that, that style of coaching. So I was I was always trying to be as, as uh, honest and, and forthcoming as I could. Um, and, and, you know, quite honestly, you, you had to know your players. You, and, and so much of, I think, my coaching philosophy was the relationships I had with them. And, you know, just going up to a guy and saying, hey, look, you've you told me how good you want to be. Is this effort going to get it done? Uh, you know what I'm saying? Like, mm-hmm. and, and they, they would come around to it. But I, I think there was, there was always great trust. Uh, with the players that I coached, and um, I wasn't much of a yeller screamer. More just, hey, this is 
this is what we have to do. This is how we have to do it. Let's let's get it done and and uh, move on. And in terms of maybe the recruiting process and selecting players that kind of fit your culture, your scheme, did you feel like you could get enough intel through, you know, parents, coaches, um, you know, people in the AAU scene maybe? Like, did you always feel like during the recruiting process you were able to kind of find those guys? Um, yes. And, and, and I think later on in my career I, I made a lot of mistakes in recruiting. Um, but I, I – I don't think, honestly, you can ever get enough information in recruiting about a, a kid and his family. Um, and, and, you know, so many times now, I mean, people are hiding the truth from you because, hey, they, they want him to go play at, at whatever university. And uh, once he gets there, if he's got issues, yeah, you guys can figure that out when you get there mm-hmm. or when he gets there. And um, but, but I think that really now, has, has sort of changed. You know, the the, the one thing uh, in recruiting that I found later on in my career, there were, there were never secrets anymore. You know, like we, we would recruit kids and we wouldn't tell anybody we were recruiting them. And, um, you know, so all of a sudden we'd get them and we'd be like, gosh, how did they get him? But nowadays with the internet or social media, whatever that stuff is, uh, there's, there's, there's no more secrets in terms of uh, the dynamics of a, of a recruitment of a young man. And you started your head coaching career back at Butler in 2000 as the head coach. And maybe talk about some of the changes in recruiting. It seems like now you have more of those one-year guys. You have your Kentuckys and now your Michigan State, your Dukes, all your top premier programs are kind of vying to get those one-and-done McDonald's All-Americans type guys. Where I think early on, maybe in your career uh, from 2000, maybe it changed in uh, 2010, 2011, that time frame where you felt like you could probably have guys for a minimum of three years. Um, right. Was there a lot of changes in your end, and how do you target a guy? And if I'm only getting a one-year guy, do I want him? Do I not want him? Yeah, you know, it, it, it's funny because we at, at Ohio State, we were sort of the first school to get blitzed by the one and done. You know, in 07, we lost three guys. We lost uh, – to one and done. We lost one in 08. We lost one in 09. Um, you know, Evan Turner stayed for three years. Jared Sollinger stayed for two years. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it, it's it's amazing sitting back now and, and watching this recruiting. Um, you know, I think, I think the biggest drastic change has been the transfer stuff. Um, and, and what's what's going on with all the transferring? But I, I, I always said this with the one and done. We we would take a one and done if if we knew he was going to have both feet in until the horn sounded. You know, we had a couple guys that had one foot out the door and, and you know one foot in, and it was funny they didn't go as high as they probably should have. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, I, I remember the the night we had gotten beat in the national championship game by Florida. And I called Mike Connolly over to the table. It's like one thirty in the morning. We're having dinner. And I said, hey, Mike, when we get back tomorrow, why don't you come by and we'll talk about next season. And he goes, what are you talking about? He goes, I'm, I'm coming back to Ohio State. And I'm like, oh, good, okay. So he turns, goes back to the table, and I turn to the coach. I said, he has no idea he's a top five draft pick. <laughs> I mean, but he just played, you know, and, 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 and I've always told his dad, I, I think he's the smartest parent I, I was ever dealt with. Because he just he just made him keep playing, just keep getting better, keep getting better, and then all of a sudden, you know, what is it now? Geez, thirteen years in the NBA. And- all right, and you and I, I think, are maybe similar in some ways. Um, I'm kind of go half and half between doing training and then doing media, you know. And part of it is because I knew when I got to college, you know, my lateral quickness maybe wasn't quite quite there. I wasn't an above the rim player, and so I quickly right. kind of figured out I wasn't going to be playing professional basketball for my career and so when was it for you because you were a talented player played at butler Uh, when did you know hey i I think it's going to be better for me after i get done with my college career uh to you know become a coach right this is a true story i I cannot make this up when i when i got to butler in 1986 or seven whatever it was the the indiana pacers you know it's, it's how everything's changed they used to come up from late august uh till october 1st when they broke for camp and they would play with us every day. And my first day at Open Gym, there's this six foot seven, hundred and ninety pound rookie out of UCLA named Reggie Miller. <laughs> so we we check up and I'm guarding Reggie Miller. And I'll never forget I walked back to my dorm, Ross Hall, looked myself in the mirror and said, 
said, you are not an NBA player. <laughs> you better find something else along the lines. And, and so, you know, it, it, it's funny you say that because it, it does sound like we were very similar. I, I, I just love to play. Mm-hmm. Um, I love college basketball. I love going to practice. And, and I knew uh, that, that, you know, when that final horn sounded, my career was over. And, and so I made the most of it. And, you know, it, it's, it's unfortunate because I, I think people now, if you do that, they say, well, he's a failure. Right. And it's like, no, he's not. He, he, he had a great career and he's, he's doing life's good work and doing something else. And um, so, no, I, I knew I wanted to go into coaching and, uh, you know, it just, it, I, I was very, very lucky. I'll, I'll be the first to admit that. Yeah. When I got done playing, uh, I remember having conversations with people and, and it was like, they're like, wait, why aren't you playing? Why aren't you? And, and you know, I, I felt so good about what I accomplished in high school and then as a college player. And for me, I just didn't feel like professionally, you know, was really on the table for me in, in long term. And it felt like I almost had to reason with people and give them a full response on, well, why I'm not playing in Italy or in Spain or, or here and there. And, you know, now that I'm uh, in my third decade of life, I don't have to answer those questions as much, but I definitely know that I made the right call. So coach, now that you're not on the floor day in and day out, and I don't know that anybody is right now amidst the, uh, the pandemic, <laughs> do you find yourself still watching a lot of basketball? Are you watching NBA today? Do you go back and watch old film or, or, do, or do you take a break and, and try to get away from it a little bit? You know, it's, it's funny that the first year I was out, I, I could care, could have cared less about basketball. And I, I, I live real close to Butler and I got two daughters that go there. So we've got season tickets. When we're in town, we'll go to the games. Um, you know, the second year I, I kind of like got back into it and, you know, I started watching games and writing stuff down. And, and you know, even last year I was, I was even more into it than I was uh, the second year out. So uh, the, the, the great thing is though, uh, I watch a game, I turn it off and I go to sleep. Um, where for 17 or well, probably 25 years of my life, game ends and you don't sleep for two days. Uh, you know, so that that aspect's been pretty pretty nice to tell you the truth. Well, and you don't have to deal with losses anymore on the court. Putting all that time in, blood, sweat, tears, and I don't I know you didn't lose that much. You know, but you don't have to deal with that anymore. So, how did you handle your losses? You know, maybe after a big game. You know, what what did you do? Did you go back watch film immediately? Maybe order in a pizza and some ice cream? And, and, and you know, how did how did you handle a loss? Um, you know, I I uh, it, 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 it's funny when you're co- I always say this when you're coaching, all you remember are the losses. Like when I was good, I, I could take you through every loss I ever had and why we lost the game. Um, when you're not coaching, you start to remember the wins. And, uh, you know, I was a guy uh, after a loss that, that I'd like to, you know, I would sit down, I'd, I'd watch the tape and and then probably get up, you know, the next day and watch it again just to, because you're you, not, I don't want to say, there's certain games you're going to lose. You know, I mean, they, they, they're better than us. They, they outplayed us. They win. But, you know, I, I think a coach's mind you know, you just you're you're always searching for answers, and 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 obviously, um, you know, I, I think one of the great attributes of, of a of a great coach is when he searches for answers when they win, you know, and and kind of you know making sure that they they get better. Um, but you know, I, I remember one year, uh, gosh, I don't know, if it was like 2011. We started the season 24 and 0. And we go to Wisconsin, we get beat by three. And after a game, I had this new assistant, Dave Dickerson, who had just joined our staff earlier that year. And after the game, I went in and said, hey, fellas, you know, we, we made some mistakes. We didn't play real well. Um, you know, let's get showered and let's get out of here. And so I walk into the coach's locker room. He's like, what, what are you doing? You didn't rip them. You didn't. I said, they didn't try to lose. We got outplayed. And, and quite honestly, we got to win on Wednesday night. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he still to this day he tells me he says it was one of the greatest lessons I, I I'd ever learned in coaching. Um, so, but then you know there were other losses when I didn't think we played well or we didn't play together or hard. Um, where they might get a Sean Miller earful, that's for sure. Mm-hmm. You know, it's interesting you say that because I do think you know the Xavier fan base is getting used to being in the Big East that they're in right now, and right. you know you have two huge conference games in a week 
And if you can get one of those, it's huge. And you might go on a three or four game losing streak, but you're still going to be in the hunt at the end of the year. So it's kind of that balance of, you know, winning games. But if you do lose, you don't want to stay down for too long. You know what's so funny? I, I go back when I first got to Xavier, Bob Huggins called me. And you know, obviously he was at Cincinnati at the time. And, and uh, he says, look, let me just tell you, I'm going to give you a piece of advice here. He says, this is a tough job. He said, because the media – treats our players like professional athletes and they're not they're college kids and I'll, I'll never forget that you know with the the Bengals the Reds uh they're in town and and uh the media can be hard on those guys at times and um but I'm, I'm with you I I don't I mean you, you know this Brad I know this I mean you, you go to practice you watch and you got a guy that just isn't giving you everything he's got or whatever and and um you know, you you know that as a as a person watching a practice, but you know, for the most part, I, I think you know kids. Uh, you know, at, at this level now, I mean, going to play college basketball, it, it's a whole another world than it was a few years ago. That's for sure. And the optics are interesting now. I mean, you had the moment a couple years ago with um, Izzo going after one of his players, and and how the media kind of promotes that, almost to a point where you know. Coach Izzo has to make an apology at some level. I can't remember if he did or not, but they kind of put it in a light like, is this acceptable? Is it not? And, right. you know, to me, that's really not the question because I've had coaches that don't yell at me at all that I didn't really have a great relationship with. And then I had some coaches that would berate me in public and I had a much better relationship to them. So I, I think, you know, you have to be really careful about what those optics look like. And at the end of the day, it's the relationship between the player and the coach. And you cannot right. tell that from a five-second clip, a 10-second clip. So, you know, right. I, I just, you know, try to be mindful of that too. You know, all those highlights and all those quick media snippets that you get, you know, you have to be, I think, careful about how you look at that relationship. And, yeah, it could coaches who have been in the wrong and maybe he doesn't have a good relationship with that player. You know, that's, that's possible. But we don't know that. I mean, those are the right, only that's... two guys that yeah. know if that he was in the right or not. I mean, that's the reality of a lot of what we see in sports and in our daily life. Yep. You know, Brad, it's funny. I, I had a situation many years ago up at Northwestern where I, I let into a kid. I took him out of game. And I actually had a hold of his shirt. I just wanted his undivided attention. Mm -hmm. And everybody thought, and they, like the next day they had the, the – the scene of me ripping this kid um, and two guys were debating saying I should be suspended from coaching. And the other guy's like, no, it's just like, but they did not know why it was, nobody knew why I was so mad at him and nobody ever asked me. <laughs> and the reason I was upset, this kid had lost the ball out of bounds and it was actually off Northwestern, and he started to argue with the official. He was right. It was our ball, but that was it. Well, two of his teammates come up and put their hands out as he's walking down the floor, like, you know, to give him five or, or whatever, like, calm him down. And he took both hands, and he smacked their hands up in the air. Mm. That's what made me mad was him being disrespectful to his teammates. So when I took him out of the game, that's what I was yelling at him about, of being – I, I didn't care about the call. I was just mad that he disrespected his, his teammates mm. and and nobody ever knew that, you know? <laughs> and, uh, so, and I remember the, the scene you're talking about with Tom, uh, yeah, yeah, I just hey, nowadays, man, you, what can you do and what can't you do? It's, it's, it's unbelievable. Well, and it, it's such a competitive environment and you know, those teams are, you know, family essentially. And the amount of hours right. that you're putting in, you know, what that game means to, you know, everyone that's involved in the game. I mean, there's a lot. It's it's important. That's what makes life meaningful is important events and challenges. And, you know, that's right. why people love sports so much because it, it brings people together that care about what happened. Now, have you had conversations with coaches maybe in, in recent years about them being maybe more careful on the sidelines just so that they don't have to deal with the media reaction? Um, I, I want to say, you know, just specifically, you know, guys know they have to be careful now. Mm -hmm. Guys know they, they, there's a time and place for, for things. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I know late in my career, if, if I lost my mind in practice, I'd eventually call a man and say, look, okay, 
I want to apologize for how I said what I said. I'm not going to apologize for the purpose of what I was saying because I had a right to be mad at you guys, mm-hmm. but maybe I shouldn't have said it the way I said it. Um, you know, can you imagine a guy like Bob Knight doing that uh, <laughs> back in the day? No, I've, so I've, I've met Bob Knight one time. He, okay, so he was actually my first interview that I ever did. And it was really? it was the funniest interaction ever. So I, I blew my knee out as a junior. So I, I, I had to sit out the whole year. And I, decided, I that, yeah. and I decided to start interviewing people at, you know, Xavier games. Just have fun. My dad was in media, so I was always interested in it. So I was like, well, I didn't want to sit on the sidelines the whole time. I want to do something with my year off. So right. Bob Knight was covering our game for ESPN when we were playing Butler at the Cinta Center. And I had gotten surgery probably two weeks before that. So I was on crutches and I saw Bob Knight. He's sitting like 20 rows up. And I was like, all right, I'm going to try and interview, you know, coach Knight. This is going to be fun. I mean, the guy's a legend he'll be fine. So I like crutch, I crutch up there to him, you know, each step. I'm like, you can, you can hear the crutch hitting hitting the stairs as I'm going up and he doesn't look at me. And I was like, oh man, I got a camera behind me. And um, he's still looking at the, the guys playing or whatever. And I was like, coach, he did, didn't look at me. I was like, coach Knight. And then he kind of like turned to me very slowly. And right. he's like, yeah. And I was like, uh, I was like, hey, you know, my name's Brad Redford. I, you know, play for Xavier. Uh, I'm not playing this year because obviously I'm, I'm injured. You know, he can see the huge brace over my knee. I was like, hey, do you mind if I ask you a couple questions for, you know, go Xavier and, and a video we're doing? And he's like, he's like, well, shit, what are you going to ask me? I was like, oh, I was like, well, I was, I was going to ask you, you know, about Butler and Xavier, you know, how these programs have, have, have risen to national prominence. And, you know, I kind of stumbled, I'm sure, over my words. And he's like, well, shit, they got good players. And I was, <laughs> I was like, all right. I was like, well, do you mind if I get it on film? And so he let me ask him two questions on film. And he walked away before I could say anything else. So that, that was my first interview um, I trying, that. trying to go from playing to, to a media career. Wow, that is that's awesome. Yeah, you can yeah. still you can still find the video, and it, you can see I w- I was scared literally the whole time. I mean, I I'm pretty pale as it is, but I was like Casper the Ghost doing that interview with Coach Knight. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh. but no, hey Coach, hey thanks for your time. I know I probably kept you a little bit long, but I c- I could talk basketball with you all day, so I could probably keep you on the phone for another three hours. But I will not do that because I'm sure you have more important <laughs> things to do. I know how much you enjoyed the interview, how much fun that you had. I, I know you had it marked on your calendar the last couple weeks, you know. So, but but <laughs> I did, been great. I do appreciate. It. I had a lot of fun talking with you. I, I think Xavier Nation uh, will love hearing from you, um, and hopefully, we'll see you at a game here down the road. I'm pretty much at every game, so. You know, if you are okay. able to come in town, I- I'd love to connect with you. And um, Andy Mack and I do a show together. So when you come oh, in, yeah, yeah. I, m- I might force you to uh, not force you, but I-, I would love to have you uh, come up with Andy and I, and we do a pregame show for the crowd. So it'd be a blast. Okay. Okay. Well, my man, I wish you the best of luck. And, and uh, you know, I'll say this once again. My, my three years at Xavier, I want to trade anything. I, I mean, just love that place when I was there. And, uh I know Travis is going to do a great job getting that thing, uh, you know, navigated through the Big East because, as you alluded to earlier, man, is that a heck of a conference. Mm Mm-hmm. No doubt about that. So, So, hey, thanks, Coach, so much. Best of luck uh, to you as well. Stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll connect again soon. Sounds good, Brad. Thank you, buddy. Okay, see you. All right, I just want to thank everybody for listening to this podcast. And if you enjoyed it, please, please leave a review and keep tuning in to more Xavier Basketball 100 Years Podcast Interviews. Two in their own city.